Well, good evening. On behalf of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, um, welcome to the third presentation in the 2014 Science Lecture Series. I'm Tim Lyons. I'm a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences. The Science Lecture Series, as many of you will already know, is a little different this year. As always, it's supported by the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, but support this year is broader. It also includes the Department of Earth Sciences, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and from a new source, the Environmental Dynamics and Geoecology Institute, or EDGE, as we're calling it. This year's lecture series is just one piece in a series of many steps in our effort to establish that institute. The institute is unique in that we'll bring together scientists from biological and chemical and earth and environmental sciences to examine specific questions about life in Earth's rapidly changing environment from the past, present, to the future. The person who will be director of this institute, which is still to be determined, will hold a newly endowed chair, the W. W. Mayhew Chair of Geoecology, which has been made possible with a $1.5 million gift from donors who wish to remain anonymous. But they're passionate, and I quote, about the ecology of the Southwest. We're deeply grateful to these donors, especially for the commemoration of Bill Mayhew. Dr. Mayhew was one of the founding faculty members of UCR and one of the three individuals who established University of California Natural Reserves. These are exciting times, certainly, for geoecology at UCR, and I and many others are benefiting from that. And within that framework, I'm particularly excited to introduce Kate Freeman, who I've known for a long time, who is our speaker in the lecture series. Kate is a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Penn State University. She's been there since 1991 and is a significant reason that that Department of Geosciences is ranked among the best in the world. In fact, her colleague just last week told me that they're number one, I think, in the United States. So um, they have Kate in a large part to thank for that. She's humbly laughing. <laughs> she is internationally known for her research in organic geochemistry, isotopic biogeochemistry, paleoclimates and astrobiology, so she wears many hats. Her research has been recognized recently, about a year ago, by the National Academy of Sciences to which she was elected. She is also a fellow of numerous societies, too numerous to mention here, but they're listed in your program. She is also a terrific teacher, um, and that's reflected in a number of teaching and mentoring awards from Penn State. Her talk tonight is entitled, What's for Dinner? Molecular Signatures of Plants, Animals, and Water in Earth Habitats. And it's based on recent work on biomarkers that have been captured in the sediments of an ancient lake at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. So without further ado, let me welcome Kate Freeman. Well, good uh, afternoon, good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to visit uh, the campus. I've not been here before, and I've had a wonderful, if slightly exhausting, uh, couple of days visiting with students and faculty and enjoying the premise and, uh, premises. And I have to say, compared to the weather in Pennsylvania, uh, it's lovely. I know you all think it's chilly, but I think it's wonderful. And I've asked in each of my conversations that we move outside and sit in the sun somewhere so I can absorb all of the photons that I haven't seen in six months. So, so thank you for a little bit of sunshine and nice weather, even though I know you folks maybe think it's a little cool. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to share with you some work that we've been doing on um, compounds uh, that we find in ancient sediments uh, in Tanzania, as Tim, Tim mentioned. And um, we're using these molecules and some of the signatures that they carry to help unravel or understand the environment in which our earliest ancestors lived. So let me start by just saying um, uh, that what's for dinner is actually a really important topic. And we often ask that question in my household where we have teenagers who are often quite curious as to what I'm going to make them for dinner. So it's a, it's a very relevant question in all facets of my life. Um, this shows. Um, some images that are taken from uh, the recent government um, or the re redoing of the gov government recommendations for dietary um, choices for, for, for Americans. In the upper left is the My Plate icon. It's actually, I think it's a really very successful graphic that illustrates what proportionally we should be eating of different food types. Um, there's a very popular uh, trend right now in diets to, to embrace the paleo diet, so I thought that was kind of relevant since that's really what I'm trying to figure out is what was the paleo diet. 
But then there's a very real, more realistic one for anybody with um, children in their household in the lower left. I don't know if you can read that, but it has things on it that include, um, you know, sticky things that you eat off of their plate and so on and so forth. So you can enjoy that. But I like particularly the lower right-hand quadrant of that, which is purple, and it's wine, of course. So <laughs> <laughs> not part of the uh, Michelle Obama's recommendations, but nonetheless um, one that I think uh, many of us enjoy. Um, and then the figure is of, of uh, the First Lady in a recent um, uh, a public service announcement, which uh, uh, a number of well-recognized basketball players joined her in eating fresh fruits and vegetables. And I don't recognize all of those players because I'm not an aficionado of basketball, but my, my son would be able to tell me who they all are if I asked him. So. <laughs> Okay, so the work that I'm going to share with you is actually a large part out of the dissertation of uh, Dr. Clay McGill. He was my uh, he finished his PhD with me a, uh, last year, just about a year ago, and he's now working at um, the uh, in in Switzerland at the ETH in uh, Zurich. And I also wanted to share with you some of his dietary choices, which you can see are caffeinated beverages. That the he he really fueled his entire dissertation by by these things and continues to do so, I think, in his time in Zurich. So we all make dietary choices. Um, actually, I, my, I got into this work not simply because I was inter interested in paleo diets, but because I was interested in paleo environments. And I've been interested in environments um, and in the face of climate change. And I'm particularly interested in how plants and, um, well, plants represent sort of this interesting intersection of climate uh, and, uh, and the carbon cycle and the water cycle in particular. And so we all know, or any of you who are gardeners, know that um, the composition of, of an ecosystem, the kinds of plants that grow in a particular place, are very much influenced by the temperature, uh, not only the absolute temperature, but just the changes in seasonal temperature, and also the amount of water uh, that's available in the landscape. And so if we can understand the plants of a past environment, it tells us some really valuable information about climate in that setting. And so these are just some lovely pictures from the National Geographic, which I pilfered from the web. And they show just illustrations of different kinds of plants. And you, you immediately look at those la different landscapes, and you already are thinking that the image on the far right of the grasslands is a drier habitat than the image in the upper left, which is a, a forested area. So we know just inherently that there's climate signals uh, encoded in the kinds of plants. And if we can find ways to understand plants in the past, then we're, we, we have a, a kind of a set of tools that allow us to explore climate and, and its interaction with uh, various questions about paleo ecosystems. In my research group at Penn State, we are interested in molecules that come from organisms in the past. Uh, we call these fossil molecules biomarkers, and they are very similar in many respects to the kinds of fossils that you might think of conventionally when you think of paleontology, like a, uh, ancient shells or, or bones. Um, for plants, they take the form of the uh, kinds of molecules you see in the lower left. There's a variety of structures. This is just a small representation. And we think about them and the information they carry, much like a paleobotanist would think about the fossil leaves that you see in the upper right-hand picture of the slide, or fossil pollen, which is in the gray image in the lower right. Uh, the molecules that I've shown you there um, include also sprinkled among them little isotopes. And I'm going to just give you a short introduction to isotopes and how we use them. Uh, and then we're going to combine together the biomarker structures and the isotope that they carry, the isotope signals they carry, to reconstruct what is in the upper left-hand corner, that is the vegetation in, a, in an ancient setting. So we're, we're kind of um, uh, detectives, if you will, or, uh, of, of past environments. And the clues that we have to work with are these little tiny molecular and isotopic remnants of who was there in the past. And it's, it's a little bit analogous to, um, and I say this as the mother of a teenager, uh, uh, that you walk into your house and you're, you know there's been a party in your house but you're not sure exactly who was there and what they did. But there's little clues left behind, like the, the cans of soda in the trash can, or the, the TV remote has been moved to another place, or there's a hole in your wall and you're not sure that was there before you left. So these little forensic clues tell us about who was present and what happened. And in the same sense, in a forensic sense or an investigative sense, we use these little clues of the past uh, to help us understand who was there and what they were doing. Okay, so here's an introduction. You can't go to a uh, baseball game and know the players without a, a card, a, a list of players. And so these are, this is a list of the players. Um, we, we use uh, isotopes of carbon and we use isotopes of hydrogen to understand um, uh, 
processes in past environments. Um, these are just little cartoons, of course, of, of atoms. They are not to scale. Um, but they represent actually the nucleus of atoms. And carbon-12 is the most abundant form on this planet. And about uh, relative to that, about 1% also on this planet is carbon-13. And the only difference between them is that carbon-13 has one more neutron in its nucleus than carbon-12. They have the same number of electrons and the same configuration of electrons around them, which means they behave chemically almost identically, virtually identically. But that little tiny difference in mass, that little bit of mass, means it's just a little bit more energy is often required for reactions that involve carbon-13 versus carbon-12. And that slight difference in mass and the corresponding slight difference in energy means that we get sorting of these isotopes by various processes. And so I'm going to explain that in the next few slides. Before I do that, I just want to call attention to the, uh, to the yellow and orange uh, um, nuclei that are illustrated below. Those are the, the uh, nuclei of hydrogen and its um, main isotope, which is deuterium. But hi hydrogen and deuterium behave exactly the same in a chemical sense, but again, there's a mass difference between them because of the extra neutron. And again, that means they have a slight difference of sort of tendency to react uh, from one or another. Typically, the lighter one reacts faster than the heavier one. Okay, so that's the introduction to isotopes. And I'm going to focus now on carbon isotopes. And just to illustrate, uh, we know a lot about carbon isotopes in the modern world and how uh, th they are distributed in, by various processes. This is an illustration of uh, carbon dioxide that's been measured at the South Pole um, by uh, air sampling. And this is a, a data from, the, from NOAA. Uh, and the U.S. government uh, collects information on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with uh, uh, great attention to various sites. This particular site shows a, a trend which you all probably know, and that is that the amount of CO2 is rapidly rising. It's going up. And that's in the upper in the uh, part of the diagram in the pink pink values. And the blue scattery plot that sort of staggers downhill like a drunk sailor is the carbon isotopic composition of that same CO2. And you can see it's dropping over as the amount is rising. And we can understand this quite readily because the amount of atmospheric CO2 is being changed by carbon released by fossil fuel. Now fossil fuel comes from dead um, algae and dead plants, and, and those carry a slightly less carbon-13 than the environment in which they were formed. So there's carbon-12 is being added back to the atmosphere as we burn this fossil carbon. And so that's why the amount is dropping, um, and, it's, and it's continuing to drop. The same trend in carbon dioxide uh, uh, isotope change is shown in various reservoirs around the world. Um, this is an example from the Great Barrier Reef, which is shown in the lower photograph. And if anybody is a fan of the Nemo movie, there's Nemo looking kind of un annoyed, I guess, at this declining CO2 isotope trend. And again, this is actually carbonate uh, minerals that have captured carbon from the water and then show that the ocean itself is declining in carbon-13. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you may have noticed in the previous slide, the value that we use, the scale that we use for isotopes um, uh, uh, is, is based on ocean carbon, which is very similar to what you're seeing here. So ocean carbon is close to zero, and this carbonate reef is close to zero. It's about one to minus, minus one to about minus uh, three per mil on this scale. And the, the CO2 is about minus eight. That, that's based on just the, the uh, the equilibrium processes that distribute carbon uh, in, in the gas form and in the dissolved form in the atmosphere, or the dissolved form in the ocean. And then what I'm interested in, in my work really focuses on is the fractionation of isotopes, that is the sorting of isotopes or discrimination against one form of isotopes versus another that takes place by photosynthesis. And when that, when, and that's illustrated with this very simple diagram, but the fractionation is the difference between two things. Plants get their carbon from CO2, and they do so preferentially taking up carbon-12 rather than carbon-13. So their isotopic signature is depleted in 13C relative to the stuff they, they uh, start with, which is the atmospheric CO2. And I, on this slide, you'll see there's two kinds of, of plant materials. There's uh, trees, and many trees have what we call a C3 pathway, and they discriminate about 20 per mil on our scale that we use to describe these relationships. Whereas grasses and other plants that are like them, which we categorize as C4 vegetation, are not as picky, and they discriminate only about 5 per mil. 
And it turns out that this difference between grasses and trees is very characteristic and very charismatic and very easily recognized in ancient materials. <coughs> The C3 signals that I mentioned um, in, that's common to trees and also non-tree plants that carry the C3 photosynthetic pathway uh, is really kind of that average value of 20 is um, there's many variations around it and that tends to be set by the amount of water in the environment. And we can understand this and plant physiologists have explained this to us um, over the years. Um, through the regulation of gas that's in, taken up by the plant and released by the plant through their stomata. They have little pores that allow gases to come in, like CO2, and other gases uh, to be released, like water. And they'll regulate the gas exchange because they don't want to lose too much water. So if it's a dry environment, they kind of shut down that stomata, which means not very much carbon dioxide can get in. And so they can't afford to be picky, and so there's less fractionation. So we see a wide range of fractionation, as illustrated by this figure, uh, for different biomes. And this is a range is from, you can see in the upper uh, line of that, diagram, of that graph, it shows from wet to dry. These are kind of compiled data for different kinds of biomes or ecosystem types that run from tropical rainforests on the far left to a dry uh, xeric scrubland uh, uh, or shrubland on the, on the far right. So there's a big range in the kind of environment, and we see a fairly sizable range in carbon isotopic composition, uh, and it's primarily associated with changes in water. There are some other factors that are important, but water is the big one. So C3 plants uh, discriminate about 20 per mil, but that it has a big range. C4 plants have a different biochemistry than C3 plants, and that largely explains their very different uh, discrimination. I'm not going to go through the details of that today, but if anyone's interested, I'm happy to discuss it um, uh, further after the talk. The key thing about C4 plants, which are mostly grasses, is that they're, um, they're very different isotopically than C3, and they have a narrow range. They don't vary a whole lot. And they're shown in red, whereas the C3 plants are shown in, in the purpley blue color. Now, C4 plants have been around uh, for a while, but they've only become ecologically important uh, over, oh, the last uh, 10 million years, which you might think, well, that's a long time, which it is. But on geologic timescales, it's actually fairly recent. And there's a lot of interest in the rise of these grassland, uh, of C4-dominated uh, ecosystems, which are largely grasslands, because they tend to uh, like dry climates and low CO2. So there's this interesting kind of connection between long time scale changes in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and possibly long time scale changes in the, the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, and the rise of these grasslands over time. And that's illustrated with this little cartoon um, uh, uh, graph that shows that the, they're favored um, when CO2 is um, relatively low and temperatures are relatively warm. And, in, and buried in that same figure but not shown is really that also where it's dry. And there's a lot of um, geochemists like to think of C4 and C3 as simply trees and grasses. It's actually not that simple. And there's a wide diversity of C4 um, uh, uh, clades, if you will, or kinds of plants that have this metabolism. They're widely distributed in the the, well, I hate to say it, tree of life of plants, <laughs> but it's, it's true. And there are many, many kinds of them, but they, they have many more grasses than the C3, if you, proportionally speaking. So we tend to think of them as grass, this is a grass signal, although I want to be careful to say that's not, strictly speaking, the only way to interpret it. Okay, well, so what we uh, and many uh, ge geologists like to do is use this signal of C3 versus C4 is to map out ancient landscapes and the relative amount of woody material, woody environments versus grassy. And this is kind of a classic diagram taken from a paper of one of my colleagues, um, Gail Ashley at Rutgers, that shows uh, the distribution of woody vegetation, the C3 vegetation, kind of gradation, with a gradation out into the grassy environment, and there's a very strong isotopic uh, signal that follows that. And so that is shown in the lower axis on that, which is our carbonates that are precipitated in the soils in which these different kinds of plants live. And they, this is a very kind of um, typical way that this information is represented as a linear mixing between the C3 and the C4 uh, carbon sources. Um, more recently, there's been a, kind of a step forward in thinking about this that comes from the work of Turi Serling. Now, Turi 
um, uh, Dr. Sterling was here uh, and gave a lecture in January on some of this work. So if, if, if you've been attending these lectures on a regular basis, you may have heard him speak about this. And he, this is wonderful work. He talks about how um, these signatures are telling us about shade. Um, so he, we call this work sh Made in the Shade. And his, his, uh, he, in this graph, you can see the vertical axis is the isotopic signature ranging from C4 uh, at the top down to C3 signals at the bottom. And then the horizontal axis is how shady the environment was, which is really another way of saying how much wood there was. Was it a forested place or was it an open grassy plain? And so he likes to use these isotope values of <coughs> organic carbon in soils to record whether it was a forested area or a grassy area. And he's done a lot of work on this. Um, and, and in addition to looking at um, the soil organic matter, he's interested in the bones and teeth of animals that ate those grasses and tree leaves. And they record also the composition of their ancient environment. And this is a kind of a complicated diagram, which I won't go through in detail. But the basic message is that you are what you eat plus four per mil on our scale. And that's what's recorded in the enamel of your teeth. So whatever you're consuming is translated into a value that is characteristic of your diet in your teeth. And, and this is used in a forensic sense for um, in, um, in criminal cases where there's a, uh, a victim of a murder and they don't know who it is, they want to figure out where they might have lived or what they might have eaten. This, this kind of information is used today in modern studies. We're trying to, you know, find little clues to put, uh, uh, put information together in a, in a, in a forensic case. And, and what Dr. Serling has used is the same information to f look at what diets uh, organisms had in the past. And in this, his work, this is, I think, uh, Dr. Serling here. This is Terry Serling on the right. Uh, uh, and on the left is one of his iconic figures that shows a really strong change from a C3 dominated signal to a C4 dominated signal. Or you can think of it as a woody dominated to a grassy dominated signal over about uh, six to eight million years ago. And this kind of profile is shown in Africa and in the United States and in Pakistan and in many places around the world. Sort of the mid-tropical um, regions became grass dominated uh, during this time period. And it's a really interesting time uh, of study and he mapped it out not by looking at plant rem remains but of the teeth uh, of animals that ate the plants. So that sets the stage for the kind of work that we do, which is not using teeth at all, but using our little molecules that we find r of the residual of the plant. So when we measure the, the molecules, we're actually measuring a little bit of the, of the plant itself. And here's some of our um, uh, compounds that we like to use. It's actually just showing the surface of a cabbage leaf in the green uh, image and then really narrowing in and looking in high magnification. You can see these little <coughs> crystals of wax that coat leaves and they're very important. They protect the leaf from being dried out and they also protect it from fungal attack. And they form these little crystals on the surface and, and they're, they're, very, um, they're very abundant. It's very waxy and it's very useful to the plant but it's also very useful to geochemists um, because these compounds are uh, well preserved on long time scales and in ancient sediments. So the compounds that I use are shown on the right on each of these slides. And the ones that we're, I'm going to talk about today are the, the very top version, the N-alkanes. These have no functional groups on them. They're just long, waxy compounds um, and uh, kind of like a paraffin, if you are familiar with candles, that the, you can buy paraffin at the store. It's often composed of material like this. Um, <clears throat> and as I said in my little subheading on the slide, these have been geochemists' um, favorite biomarkers since the 1960s. In the early days of our field, the analytical tools were pretty th um, uh, crude by today's standards, and so these molecules are easy to analyze. And so there's actually a lot of data that goes back uh, multiple decades now because they were some of the first that could be analyzed. And there's some really nice work that dates back to that time. Okay, so these are the molecules I'm going to use, and it's, they're really fantastic. They're too big to be soluble in water, so rain doesn't wash them away. They're too big to be transported across cell membranes, so bacteria don't degrade them very easily. And that's all good news for me because they hang around, and we can measure them in the past. And when we measure them in the past, we find um, there's, uh, that they carry the same kinds of environmental information that Dr. Serling and others find in bone or in carbonate or other, uh, other soil organic matter and other materials. This is illustrated here on this slide. I've, got, I've just repeated the same uh, um, graph that uh, Serling used to show the rise of C4 in the diet of many kinds of animals. 
And on the right is the rise in the C4 signal of N alkanes that we measured from sediment cores. And we actually got these samples from um, colleagues, including Dr. Serling. So he's, he and I have been um, communicating about the cross comparison of the bones and the carbonate minerals with the molecules for many years now. So they carry the same information, and um, they, we use them then to study past environments, particularly where you, you don't always find bone. They're actually, it's actually sometimes kind of rare to find bone, or sometimes you don't find carbonate minerals because it doesn't preserve in that environment. But often in those same environments, we find organic compounds preserved. So it just opens up more possible environments where we can make measurements. So uh, yesterday I gave a talk to the uh, geology department in more detail on this, uh, what you see on this slide, but I just want to say that we use the molecules of, uh, from plants to um, interpret not just C3 versus C4, but the structure of an ecosystem. Is it woody or is it more open and grassy? And it's not a simple linear mo model, but it's more, a uh, little more subtle than that, and that's shown in this graph. So the bottom part of this graph is the same soil organic matter data that I showed you previously from Serling's work. And the top of the graph, on the very top axis, is our scale for biomarker signatures. So we can translate between uh, soil organic matter and our little fossil molecules. And that's, this is a useful tool. So we can make that measurement and then we can say, okay, we think this environment looked like this. So now we have our tool. Let's go do something fun with it. And so we're all going to go to Tanzania. Doesn't that sound fun? So we're going to go to Tanzania and we're going to share with you some work. Actually, I haven't been to Tanzania. I would love to go. Um, my, my former student, Clay, is going this summer and I'm just green with envy, but hopefully I'll get there one of these days. So I'm working on that myself. But nonetheless, the site, sites that we've been working at is through uh, collaborations with folks who've been working for a long time at Olduvai Gorge. And anybody who reads National Geographic knows Olduvai Gorge because National Geographic loves this place. They always are printing stories about Olduvai Gorge. And the fossils are early ancestors that are found there. And there's a little star on the world map to show, or an Africa map to show where it is. And you can see one of the characters who hang, hung out there about two million years ago, shown in the bone uh, illustration of the skull. And then the bottom left is actually the Leakey family having a picnic and doing some work uh, at Old Divide Gorge. And Richard Leakey, um, uh, Louis Leakey, and, and Mary Leakey, and then Richard Leakey, and Meve Leakey are all, uh, the Leakeys uh, have been doing work in this uh, place for many, many decades. So it's very iconic, very, very important. It's actually a World Heritage Site, which is good to know, and it's very carefully protected um, from, um, you know, the, the casual tourists picking up something and walking away with it. They, you can't do that. Um, so Old Divide Gorge, we know a lot about it. Um, it was once an ancient lake. This lake was pretty uh, um, alkaline. It wasn't water that you could drink, um, and that's pretty typical of lakes of that size in this part of Africa today. Um, and it um, was um, uh, near some volcanic highlands, which is really good news because every once in a while they would burp and release ash and volcanic material that can be dated. So there's really great knowledge of the age of these sediments and that's, that's kind of nice, um, very helpful actually. Um, and uh, the sediments of the lake, you know, it was a low point. That's where water gathers. It makes it low. But because it's near this volcanic area, it's sort of tectonically active. And the whole area has been lifted up uh, it, since its deposition two million years ago. And whenever you lift up land and you have water running through it, water likes to carve a channel. So a channel or a gorge has been cut into this, which exposes the ancient lake sediments which is great, isn't that fun? So we can go and take samples from the sediment, uh, from the walls of this gorge, and we have uh, uh, samples through time of this ancient lake environment. On uh, the right side, you see a map of the lake as it extended uh, when it was really wet in the outer ring and then when it was really dry in the inner ring. And so this lake we know expanded and contracted over time, over different um, time scales. And, um, and the white gash through that map is the gorge that exposes those sediments today. On the left is an artist's reconstruction of what it was like hanging around in this lake catchment in the past with our early ancestors in the foreground chopping up its dinner, right? And then there's a lot of flora and fauna, animals that are shown um, and plants that are shown in that uh, environment. I will just point out that the only organism that has a lick sense is the elephant, which is standing in the shade, right? And everybody else is out in the sun. So um, this is not a very realistic rendition probably, but it's kind of illustrates the kinds of animals and plants that were there. <coughs> 
So we we were able uh, through uh, work that uh, Gail Ashley, who's uh, at Rutgers University, has been doing at this place for a long time. She invited us into her. A laboratory where she had lots of these sediment samples, and we were able to take sediments and measure the plant waxes through the history of the lake. And that's shown in the next figure, which is um, just an illustration of a, a kind, just to remind us that what's in, buried in the sediments of the lake is the terrestrial material, the plant material gets washed in, so we're kind of sampling the catchment, the plants that are in the catchment of this lake. And on the left side is these wiggly lines represent different uh, signatures that we've measured. And I want to point out um, on the far right is our algae biomarkers, the data for biomarkers from algae. They don't do very much. They don't wiggle around very much. It's kind of the same. But there's much bigger changes in the plant waxes, and they're shown on the far left side. And those show changes that very dramatically go between the C4 signal and the C3 signal, or the grassy signal and the woody signal. And, they, and it kind of slams back and forth between these two ecosystems with transitions as short as a couple thousand years. Very, very abrupt changes from very open grassy to very uh, wooded uh, and back again. And this is, this is a really interesting uh, phenomenon itself. We have looked at this in a variety of ways, um, and what we do know is that this high variability tracks very nicely with changes in the orbit of the planet. And this is a processional cycle, which shows the, the procession is the sort of the, the, the way the, um, the Earth spins like a top. It's a little uh, off its main, the axis of rotation sort of spins around. And that we can calculate that, that uh, pacing or that magnitude of change, and that's shown in the top part of that diagram. And then the bottom diagram are, are what we observe. And you can see it pretty much is driven strictly by this changes in the amount of sunshine that comes to northern Africa that, uh, that varied with the, the orientation of the planet. And that change in the amount of sunshine drove the intensity of the monsoon system uh, that dominates uh, e uh, eastern Africa even today. Um, there is a little bit of buried uh, signal that comes from changes in the ice volume the, at the poles, which is on a 40,000-year cycle, this is, but this is primarily a 20,000-year cycle that we see here. So there's global climate is being translated into variations at this one little lake in eastern Africa. And as a consequence, these little changes in sunshine and big changes in the monsoon, we have very dramatic changes in the kinds of plants and the ecosystems surrounding that lake. This is of interest to people who study early hominids because there's a whole slew of hypotheses of how climate and hominid evolution are linked. And uh, Rick Potts, who's at the Smithsonian Institution, has written perhaps most vol voluminously on this, but there's lots of others who think about this. And there's ideas about how this, the the magnitude of change might influence um, hominid evolution. Because right about this time, uh, the, the first homo genus uh, uh, arose, and then it's the beginning of the in increase in brain size. And so there's a suggestion that highly variable environments leads to sort of the need to, or favors the selection of organisms who are smart enough to figure out how to continuously adapt their strategies to constantly changing conditions. So, so Rick Potts loves our data because it shows this high variability consistent with his ideas. There are other hypotheses out there, but that's, that's one of them. Okay, so, so we know it's a highly variable landscape. I haven't answered the question yet, what's for dinner? So let's, let's focus on that. And um, he, these are the folks who are coming to dinner. This is just some of the different kinds of, of early hominids that have um, been documented in Eastern Africa and, and throughout Africa. I actually, we just, we just had a, a speaker at um, Penn State come, Kay Berensmeyer, who works with some of these hominid fossils. And, and she really emphasized to me that we don't just have a few fossils. I think that's kind of what we, we often think from maybe the National Geographic articles, that one fossil can revolutionize our understanding of them. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of hominid fossils that have now been documented. And even more than their teeth and their skulls and their leg bones, we find they've found tracks of them walking in mud. And there's a lot of tracks of footprints. And so you can tell a lot about an organism when you have their footprints. You can tell how they walked and maybe the, the, their, their weight and, their, and the, the nature of the group they were walking with, if there's multiple footprints. So there's really, a, really kind of a, a renaissance of study uh, of these early organisms, our, our earliest ancestors. Um, and and it's, it's not like when I was a kid reading National Geographic and one new fossil would change it, everything. It's, there's really a lot of data.
And some of these different organisms are highlighted in this graph and the, the age in which they arose. We're going to narrow in at about two million years ago. I've shown you that that time period was uh, characterized by big changes in the landscape and the vegetation uh, across um, uh, this, this little catchment of Olduvai, Lake Olduvai. Um, and the question we want to ask is with these creatures running around, or some subset of them running around, what kinds of things were available for them to consume? And to answer that question, we want to look at what is the spatial pattern, what's the geographic, if you will, uh, arrangement of the different kinds of plants in this catchment. Um, and we have evidence sort of swinging back and forth between the wet and the dry conditions. But within one of those time periods, what was the distribution of plants? And so then um, we're very fortunate that um, uh, well, during one of the driest moments in this time, and you can see that little red circle highlights one of the driest times, that moment when it's really dry, the lake was contracted, very small lake, and the old lake bed became a soil. And this soil um, has been discovered and described first by Mary Leakey, who's shown in the upper left, and uh, because what was so cool about the soil is they found, she found, uh, some of the first, the oldest tools used by hominids, and uh, stone tools, little flakes of, of stone, along with bones that had been cut with these tools, right? And, which is neat, and, um, but these tools are not just scattered anywhere, they're kind of concentrated in sort of a, in a, in a, in a particular regions. So that's interesting. This one horizon that she's mapped out also has associated with it uh, freshwater uh, carbonate minerals, which are shown in the upper right. That's a picture of Gail Ashley in the field pointing to one of these carbonate deposits that show us that there was fresh water from a natural spring. That, so, so we're beginning to get some clues here of what they had for dinner. They used stone tools. There were some animal bones that maybe they were cut for purposes of eating. And then there was fresh water nearby. So we have some interesting pieces here of our puzzle. What we were able to do, thanks to Gail Ashley's generosity, is look at quite a number of samples from this horizon. It turns out that this, this horizon was covered by, the soil environment was covered by an ash layer. Remember I said there's a lot of volcanic activity there. And this ash layer dumped on top of the soil and kind of preserved the, ancient, the remains of that ancient landscape for us to look at. It's like a molecular Pompeii, as, a, as I describe it. it. It was the Pompeii of Olduvai. It captured not only these bones, but also a lot of organic matter that we can study. And here's some, here's some illustrations of, of this, the, the uh, sediments that are um, in this region. And that actually, the left-hand picture, which is the big picture, shows you that there's actually quite a lot of stuff on top of this layer that the archaeologists are scraping off and evaluating. But really, what they're after is that layer that's several meters down where they find the bones and the tools and some hominid skulls and uh, uh, things of that nature. So. Um, Here's an illustration of a gentleman working on this horizon. They very carefully, in, in, in the way that archaeologists do, sort of study each little parcel of, of the landscape. And what um, is shown in the kind of funny uh, dogleg uh, map is the distribution of the tools that were first described by Mary Leakey. And this is a kind of a way of plotting their density, how many there are. Rather than showing each individual, we're showing kind of how dense they were on that, on that landscape. And I think if I can see there's a there's a scale bar for distance. It's not shown on this figure. I'll show you in a subsequent figure. But this is this scale is over kilometers. It's not a little tiny amount of space. It's actually a fairly sizable landscape. And I'll show that to you in a, in a coming slide. But what I want you to notice is that there's sort of a central location where there's a lot of density of tools. right? And this is what Mary Leakey first described. This is not n a new observation. This has been around since the 1950s when she first did her work. And subsequent data has reinforced that. There are these concentrations of tools and what they call bu bu butchery debris, so bones that have been kind of picked at. <clears throat> and here's some illustration. These are not actually from Olduvai, but they're from a nearby site. And they're the same age and the same t kind of technology. And the little white arrows in this, this is a very nice dissertation, a figure from a dissertation that recently was completed, um, where you can see there's, and maybe you can't from the audience, but there's little tiny cut marks that, that are uh, observed on these different bones. And this, is, this has kind of spawned a controversy, because these, they're clearly cut, but there's also predator marks. It's like tooth marks from large 
predators on these carcasses. So not hominid teeth, but like a large cat um, in the environment. So there's been this debate whether there, and it continues, and I don't have an answer to it, but there is this really interesting debate of whether the early hominids were scavenging bones that had been taken down by a predator, or if they were the hunters and took their dinner from the bones, and then a, uh, a, an animal came later and scavenged, right? So who's doing the hunting is not entirely clear, and that's an active debate uh, for these, these, um, this butchery debris, which is sort of fascinating, really. Um, okay, so that's, that's what the archaeologists work with. And then we got samples from the same locality, and this is just a map of where our samples are from. And you can see there's, there, we've got a pretty good coverage. We've got actually more coming this summer, and my student is going back. My former student, I should say, is no, no longer my student. That happens with the best of them. They get their degrees and they go off and do good things. But nonetheless, he's going back this summer, and we're going to continue to collaborate on this project. Um, and you can see the distribution of the kinds of samples, or the many samples that we have so far, um, over this landscape. So they, we tried to get from the northern site, that central site, and then down in the southern site. And so as I describe our results, I'll be sharing with you the northern, central, and southern. Um, but remember, the bones are in the central site. Okay, So the bones and the debris is in the central site. And we're going to use a couple of tools, these molecules that we've been uh, using for other studies. We're going to use here as well. And that's just a reminder that we can measure the carbon isotopes and infer is it grass or was it wooded and, or something in between. In addition, on the lower part of that graph, we can use long and short alkanes to indicate whether there were wet plants were aquatic or on land. And that's another tool that we can use. And um, I'll be using some of that data in our interpretation of these landscapes. So just the length, of the chain length uh, ratio tells us aquatic or terrestrial plants, and then the isotopes tell us, of the, of the terrestrial plant compounds, tell us if it was grassy or woody. And here you go. You guys ready? Here it is. Here's our data. I'm, I'm kind of a data maven. My students know if they want to make me happy, bring me data. Right, and then, then I'll talk to you. <laughs> so, so I always like a good data slide. Here's one, and I'm just reminding you of that paradigm or that framework that we use to interpret our isotope values in the lower part of the diagram. And then the, the graph itself or the map shows the carbon isotopic composition of the plant waxes across this landscape, and the really dark green ones are right in that center region. Right? So you can see the dark green on our diagram in the lower one is the woodiest signal, and so the debris, remember the debris is in the center, the debris is mostly in the woods. Isn't that cool? I think that's just so cool. So, but we're not done yet. So there's something weird at the top in the northern sites. They're kind of these intermediate values. And there's some evidence, a little bit of fossil evidence that from the birds and some bones of small reptiles and, bird and, and um, uh, amphibians that this was maybe an aquatic environment or a wetland area. So we, we can also use that chain length ratio that I described. I'm not going to show you that data, but it also confirms that this is a wetland area. And down in the south, it's not trees at all, but it's very, very strongly C4, very, very strongly suggestive of a grassy environment. So we can hypothesize that the Zinge landscape, or this, this, this archaeological horizon, which is being so carefully excavated, included in it a wetland in the north, a woods in the middle, in the central area, and then a grass area outside. To confirm that it was a wetland, we used some other biomarkers. These come from sedge plants, these uh, five um, uh, alkyl resorcinols. And uh, these are actually really interesting. They're very uh, popular in the study of um, antioxidants and lipid chemistry in our food. And so there's actually a very large literature on these compounds and their occurrence in different kinds of grains that we might eat in our diet today. And that was really useful for us because we could look at that that um, literature and say, oh yeah, there's a really a lot of these in rye. So when we needed a standard from, uh, we went and bought rye from the grocery store and brought it back and extracted it and worked up our standards. So that was very convenient. What is different about the sedge is that they have in particular these 25 carbon uh, chain lengths. So there, there's a particular kind of um, these resorcinols that is characteristic of sedge. And the lower left is, a, is an illustration of a sedge plant. This is a very iconic plant, and this is papyrus. And papyrus, of course, the Egyptians used to make paper. It's very famous in the history of technology and mankind. But it's also very widespread in African environments even today. It is a C4 plant. And so many archaeologists have invoked papyrus or papy sedges like papyrus as a substrate that would have a C4 signal that the animals, the ancient hominids, ate. 
And we said, oh, well, we can test that by measuring the isotopes of these molecules. And that's exactly what we did. And we were, um, uh, the answer is not what people wanted to hear because we found, in fact, like many sedges in alkaline lakes, they were, in fact, C3 sedges. So that kind of shoots down the sedge, which make these sort of ribosomes, these sort of root structures that can be eaten as a food source, takes them off the plate, if you will, for um, C4 uh, sources of, inf of, of food. So they, these carried out C3 uh, photosynthesis at Olduvai, and their biomass is a very low value. And they're only present in the northern sites where we have all sorts of preponderance of evidence now that that was some kind of wetland environment. Um, and, and, uh, and it's juxtaposed with that freshwater spring that Ashley has described. So we have woods in the middle, we have a wetland in the north, and just for the final piece to confirm that that south area was grassy, we turn to lignin. And lignin is a biopolymer that's very important in many kinds of plants. It constitutes a large, uh, the structural biomolecule or biopolymer that is important in wood. Um, and it's, but it's also, there's kinds of lignin in non-wood tissues and leaves. And that's shown with these two photographs. The, the top one, obviously, is a wood cross-section, so we all know what wood looks like. The bottom one is actually a leaf tissue that's been nibbled on by organisms, but they left the lignin behind because it's not very tasty or nutritious. And so you can see that sort of lacy fabric. That's the lignin in non-woody non tissues that's present. Um, the nice thing for us is that the molecules of lignin or the components of lignin vary whether it's a woody tissue or a non-woody tissue. And so we can measure the ratio of the woody kinds of molecules versus the non-woody and have a sense of whether those southern sites were grassy or woody. And that's exactly what we've done. I'm just showing you some of those compounds on the right side. Um, and then the, the interpretive framework for those ratios is shown in the center. Really, all you need to know is that as on that lower axis, if you go to the left, it's woody. If you're um, over to the right, it's grassy. And that's what we, I'm going to show you in the next slide. And that's, on the, again, the same axis on the bottom. And it's woody on the left and grassy on the right. The vertical axis is the carbon isotope profiles of the alkanes, and we see that grass, strong grassy signal with the highest values all the way at the top also has the non-woody lignin signal. So it's very clear to us, at least, we're quite convinced that those southern sites were just open grassland without a lot of shade um, or, or woody plants of any kind. So I tried to illustrate with some figures of the kinds of environments we think we're dealing with in Olduvai. There's a wooded area, there's a wetland area full of turtles and snakes and who knows what else, and, and birds, of course, and then the whole catchment was dominated by grass, so it kind of was in, encased in an in a envelope of grassland and, and surrounding it. So that's what was happening on this ancient uh, lake bed, and that's kind of confirmed by the um, preponderance of data that we've put together. Now I've, I've kind of combined together um, all of the kinds of information that we've been using, the isotope figures, um, the, the aquatic signals are shown in blue, those ratios of aquatic to non-aquatic plants, and the, the, the isotopes that and, uh, in green in the center show wood, woody structures, and then juxtaposed to the right of that is that original map of where all the fossils are, just to re remind us that the, the Early hominids, like that elephant in that drawing that I showed you earlier, they were hanging out in the shade, and that's where they were having dinner. They, so they were having their butchery and um, uh, activity was concentrated in the woods or maybe right on the edge of the woods, what, geog what ecologists call an ecotome, that kind of transition from wood into grassland area. And, and so you can see that the pink is just a slightly, slightly south of the the green concentration. So they were kind of hanging out on the edges of the woods, perhaps. There's all sorts of reasons why they would hang out in the woods to have dinner. Uh, maybe protection of, from prey would be a big one, um, but also possibly protection from the sun, thermal, thermal protection uh, was maybe also important to them. Um, but it's also juxtaposed right near the water source. So when we think about the, what they had for dinner, well, they obviously had some meat because there's some butchery going on, but they also had something to drink um, with that. Okay, so the last uh, few things I want to show you is turning now to the teeth data that Serling and others have worked up to show us what uh, the dietary signals were directly from the teeth of these uh, early hominids. That's shown in this figure from a recent paper from Turi uh, Serling. And there's different colors of the symbols represent different uh, genus of, or different organisms, different early hominids. And you can see early in the history, this, this time scale I believe is about four or five million years from left to right. 
And you see the earliest ones are in the red. They're very concentrated. They have all kind of the same composition. And then as we go forward in time, there's different species and taxa that emerge, but also there's greater diversity in the diet as illustrated by the composition of their teeth. And, and that's a very interesting thing, and it suggests even within one taxa, there's a lot of variability in the diet that they had. So we're not going to give one answer to what they had for dinner that's characteristic of the whole population. But I think what's characteristic of these later populations is that they had a lot of things for dinner. There's a great variety, as illustrated by the range of isotopic signals that are encoded in their teeth. And there's a whole other source of information that comes from looking at the teeth themselves, whether they're worn down or they're, they have high crowns or what kinds of little scratches are on them, maybe from a little bit of uh, um, glass. There's a little bit of silica in grasses, and that could scratch the teeth. And so were they eating soft things? Were they eating hard things? Were they eating a variety of things? So there's a lot of information that comes from there. And it suggests, it's kind of consistent with this, that they ate a lot of different things. So now we're going to set the table, right, with our isotopes and our biomarkers. These are some organisms that were important at Olduvai at this time period. What our early, the earliest uh, uh, Homo genus is illustrated by the Habiline uh, line here in the, in the lower figure. And the upper one is this Boisei, Paranthropus Boisei. It's the nutcracker. He has this huge jaw. And you can, he and she, they have these, this enormous jaw. And there's an orbital ridge on the top where the muscles that controlled the jaw were connected. And the, and the early archaeologists envisioned this as a nutcracker because he had these great teeth and this great jaw and these great muscles that must have been crunching on great things. Well, no. Um, <laughs> actually, not at all. It has a very strong C4 or grassy signal. And so maybe it was uh, eating meat that was dining on grass, like an animal, like a, a deer-like animal that maybe ate grass and then they ate that. Um, or it was eating little green bits of the grass itself or some other form of grass. One of the speculations that has often been put out there is that it was eating these sedge compounds. Remember the papyrus? Well, we've, we've put a hole in that one. We can't, we can't offer that as one of its choices now. Um, but this is kind of the way this, this information is thought about. From the teeth perspective, the isotopes of the teeth, we can say, oh, it's 76 uh, percent C4 and the rest is C3, some sort of linear mixing. What we're trying to do with the biomarkers is just fill that out a little bit. So I'm going to put those on the table as well. I'm almost done. This is just the last couple slides here. So we have the grass, which we confirm with our isotopes from the, the, gra the lipids and the trees down below. And then we can add in the sedge, which is minus 26. And then by some kind of mass balance uh, arguments, we can say there's these cryptogams, which are little, little non-woody, non-grassy plants that um, mosses and things like that that might have been in the environment and could also have been a source of food. Um, and it's also quite possible, and, and, and Clay and I think this is quite likely, that they, some of these organisms might have been eating like turtles or little frogs or things from the wetland that would carry sort of a wetland signature, uh, particularly for the habiline. So they, the real message here is that what's for dinner is a lot of things, and there's a lot of diversity in the isotopic signatures um, that the food substrates carry. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here. We're just about at the end of the hour. Um, the, the main messages I want to get across is that there was this um, highly variable environment at 2 million years ago, about 1.8 million years ago, uh, with massive shifts between grassland and forest, back and forth, um, and that this was climate controlled, and it very fundamentally changed the landscape. Um, the Zinge horizon, this famous archaeological horizon, had we've, we've really, the, the heart of our work here is that we've mapped out these, these different uh, ecosystems across this landscape with the wetland uh, shown by the aquatic lipids and the, the sedge compounds, the center where the isotopes and the lignin really show us was forested, and the south was an um, open grassland area. And the trees um, were where the, or the forested areas where the bones and the, the debris and the hominid fossils are all located. So clearly they were hanging out in the shade, having dinner, and, and actually there's archaeologists who feel that this meat um, uh, uh, consumption was really the dawn of socialization because they would bring meat together clearly in a central place and possibly share it with less able uh, members of the community, whether it was older people or young children. And that beginning of sharing is really the beginning of society. And so that, that kind of gives me the tingles when we think about how we're trying to help understand where that central place was. Well, it was in the woods, and we know that. 
So the diet choices were not just simply C3 or C4, but there were actually a complicated a range of possible options, and maybe all of the above, particularly for the habiline, which has teeth that suggest it ate a variety of things. Um, and <clears throat> this, so I, I turn, I, well, the final thing I would just point to is the paleo diet was some combination of plants and meat uh, and water <laughs> in this ancient environment, just like is advocated today by uh, people who are proponents of the paleo diet. Um, and so what's for dinner? Well, the paleo diet, of course. Um, that's the answer. Um, finally, I just want to thank um, uh, many of the students and uh, colleagues I've had the great pleasure to work with. I want to thank Tim and, and all of the folks uh, here today for hosting my visit. It's been a real treat. And finally, I want to thank all of you for listening. So thank you. Kate, for a terrific talk. So uh, many of you will know that the standard routine now is that we'll open the floor to questions. And what we ask you to do is to raise your hand so that the usher can come over to you with the microphone and, and state your question. And, um, and then hand the microphone back. And Kate will repeat the question and, and answer it. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> so, hope so. Maybe. <laughs> or dodge it. Whatever. <laughs> Is there any evidence for um, harvesting the grass like mm. as green? Okay, so the question is, was there any evidence for harvesting? So we have the hunting, but do we have the gathering side of this? That's. Um, I don't know of any evidence for that specifically. All we can um, say is that it's quite possible that was the case. Um, if they're sharing meat, why wouldn't they also share uh, plant materials, which are actually less risky to acquire, right? So, so I think it's likely that that was the case, but I don't know of direct evidence for that. Yeah, it's a good question. Oh, yeah. You have four different men of uh, hominids. What's the time frame? Right. So, there, so it, the emerging sense is that there were multiple. So the question is, what's we had coexistence of multiple or uh, hominids, is that right? And what's the time scale of that coexistence and and relationship to changes in the environment, right? Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. It's kind of the cent centerpiece of a lot of work that's going on today on understanding the relationships of those different organisms. We know pretty well that there's these major groups. Uh, of these genus and uh, species of hominids. And we know pretty well that they coexisted at that time because you find them together uh, in the same horizons. Um, so this is a really interesting and kind of a departure from maybe this progression that we think of, right, as so one evolves into the other. And there's that really famous picture of early hominids evolving into modern man and then devolving into a computer programmer, right? There's that. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. But that's that linear mo model doesn't seem to be what the bones are telling us, that they were coexisting uh, and and how they coexist and were they competing or did they specialize in different niches? That's, that's a really interesting set of questions. It's certainly the isotopes are suggesting to us that they differentiated in their diet from each other. The different uh, uh, species were eating different things characteristically, although there was a lot of variability. The time scale of our study is just a little slice of time, about 100,000 years uh, or 200,000 years at about 2 million years ago. So it's a, just a little slice. Um, and and what's tricky is to tie together the variability we see in the environment with the evolutionary change that's documented. And, and um, it's, it's easy to sort of identify these different groups. It's hard to connect them, like who evolved into whom. That's actually, I'm not going to touch that because that's a, the, it, the paleoanthropologists really argue about that and they could hurt me, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, but it's a great question and central to a lot of work. Oh, and and now I'm in, a, now I'm in trouble. trouble. <laughs> it's a little bit long, um, but I'll try to make it short. Um, so I, I'm wondering within a particular species of hominid or across the species, that's not really the center part of the question, whether there's any sense of evolving intelligence. Yes. And let, so let me clarify that in the sense of perhaps desperation where you're just doing herbivory. Um, right. I'll eat whatever's there. And then perhaps you're scavenging, and then perhaps you're hunting. And, and, I, and in my mind, it played out two ways, that, that as you're hunting, you may ultimately become more selective, mm -hmm. or you might see a broader range because you can kill an apex predator, where before you can only eat the spoils from an apex predator. Right. 
right. And, and, and then even is there a charcoal record where you start ah. to see history of them starting to cook? Yes. Okay. So there's. Um, so do I need to repeat that question? Because it's. I don't know if I can. <laughs> but. <laughs> so there's clear evidence that brain size increases. Right. Um, and the earliest um, Homo erectus or Homo ergaster uh, had smaller brains, and then the same species later had bigger brains. Right. So there's sort of an evolving change in cognition or c cognitive ability, um, as evidenced by brain size. Um, whether that's happening with a dietary link, I don't think we have the data yet to to figure that out. But I think that's the the you know a focus of work that like Turi Serling is is trying to do is sort of link those developmental changes to changes in diet. Um, the question about fire is very near and dear to my heart. We're actually totally keen to look for fire in these same horizons, and I have a, a master's student that I'm hoping will run them soon, um, so I can answer that question directly. Fire is an interesting one because the ecology of grasslands is driven by fire. Their fire uh, is an important part of the life cycle of, of many grass systems. Um, and so you would expect that there would be a, a, fa a fire signal. The question is whether humans manipulated fire, right? And there are some evidence of uh, fire rings, not in this locality, but in later uh, horizons. Um, and there's a book that um, argues that the rise of cooking gave rise to the, you know, the cognitive abilities that we have because we could spend less time digesting, right? And the, so this, and the, and the book pins this uh, fire hypothesis to exactly this time period, right? But it's, it's a, the data are a little shaky. We are very interested in fire compounds, and there are um, compounds called PAH, or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that are readily produced during combustion and should be preserved in our little molecular Pompeii. So I hope I can answer your question soon. And to do that, I need to go home and ask my master's student, um, how are we doing? <laughs> How's that data? <laughs> so we're, we're fascinated. And the question really is, do, can we see a deviation from what we would expect based on the grassland dynamics? And that deviation might be a hint at human manipulation. And there might be help of finding it localized versus a broader or Potentially, sure. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm actually, just after I get back from this uh, trip, I'm then going on another trip to Indiana University where there's a team of us who are beginning a planning uh, for drilling new uh, samples from this site for new cores. And that those might be particularly good for this because the preservation should be uh, even better. Yeah. So I, we're, yeah, we'd like to know if they were cooking their dinner <laughs> or perhaps using fire to and aiding their, their um, hunting, um, which is known to have happened by Native Americans and other societies, so, yeah, it's good, great, great possibilities there. Other questions? Uh, there's one here. Were you able to discriminate between the isotopic ratios of, um, if they were eating animals, and these animals pres pres presumptively would be those that could eat grass, Right. so is there a way to tell the difference between the two ratios? Um, if you, if I go back a slide, so the question was, can we tell the difference between animals that ate grass as a dietary substrate versus the grass itself, right? right. Were the humans eating, or the human ancestors? Right. Were the, right. were the hominids eating grass, or were they eating animals that ate grass, right? right? Okay. That, okay, that's a hard question to answer with carbon, okay. uh, because the animals kind of look like their diet, um, and so it's, it's a little difficult to distinguish. You are what you eat, basically, plus a per mil. And, uh, but nitrogen can tell you trophic levels. So can, we can say whether an animal was eating another animal that ate another animal. That should be very easily distinguished by nitrogen isotopes. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's not a lot of uh, protonaceous material or nitrogen-carrying material that's preserved uh, in these ancient hominid fossils. But if we can get smart about how to get to nitrogen in them, that would be exactly the question that people would want to answer. Yeah, it, uh, it, would, it would allow us to explore a food web uh, it, using these hominid materials. We're not there yet, but I, kn I know people would love to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. well, so after a long day, we're going to feed Kate soon. Yes, right. What's for dinner, Tim? Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and thank Kate once more for a really terrific. Talk. Thank you.